Oh, no. I knew I shouldn't have thrown my used condom into that pit of nuclear waste. Now I... Now I've created a monster. No. Worse! I created a spunk monster! Hello. I've returned. Now, if you tuned to the last video, you have seen me complain about my deep, seething hatred for The Evil Within, a game I talked about for uh, about 25 to 30 minutes and complained about a lot. 30 minutes is a long time if you really think about it, but yet I am now here talking about the second game. Now you're probably wondering why I even bothered, especially after I was instantly killed all the time. For a really long time. The reason I even bothered coming back was because I had a lot of hope in this developer. It's not just Shinji Mikami, who I have a lot of respect for. There's a lot of other developers here who have worked on a lot of other amazing games. So I could see them all turning it around and just making a great game that just makes up for every problem I had with the first game. And because I think I might be a total masochist, I think I, I, I might have a serious problem and need help. So, despite me going into The Evil Within 2 with a lot of tempered expectations, I mean, when I bought the game, I definitely didn't have as much enthusiasm as I did when I bought the first game. Despite all of that, I love this game, which is fucking insane, being as the first game, I think, is garbage. There was a lot of irredeemable qualities that they somehow managed to completely fix, but what makes it more insane is just everything that went on behind the scenes. This game's development should have made it a recipe for disaster, yet it's better in every way. Development for The Evil Within 2 began in March of 2015, shortly after the first game's DLCs were finished, and upon the beginning of the development of The Evil Within 2, there was a huge change. Shinji Mikami stepped down as game director, and instead took on a supervisor role. Now, this is something I see as kind of bittersweet, because although I really didn't like, the Mikami-led predecessor, I never once had the thought that a sequel would be 100% better if he wasn't heading the development. If anything, I wanted to see what he would do to improve upon the original, but thankfully he didn't step down due to fan outcry or anything. The reception to the original was generally positive, nothing stellar or anything, but it still has its fans. The real reason Mikami stepped down was because he felt it was time for younger talent at the studio to take the lead, after he mentored them throughout the development of the first game. Now. That is a huge gamble to take for your studio's second game, that game being a sequel no less. But Mikami's gamble was right on the money, because The Evil Within 2's director, John Johannes, hits it right out of the park with his first time sitting in the director's chair. And what makes it even more impressive is that the development cycle for this game was only about a year and a half, less than half the time it took for the development of the first game. That's insane! I knew Tango Gameworks was capable of being a talented studio. <laughs> Alright, so I'll tone it down with the gushing for now, but let's take a look at what makes The Evil Within 2 so special. The Evil Within 2's truncated development cycle wasn't the only thing that was going against the game before its release. The original Evil Within's reception wasn't exactly the best. The main reason for the game selling as well as it did largely had to do with Shinji Mikami's pedigree, and with a lot of the marketing taking advantage of that fact. The critical reception was nowhere near bad, like I said, it was actually generally positive. No one hated the game or anything, actually. My hatred of the game actually puts me in a pretty small minority, but there were many who were disappointed by the game we got. So convincing people this one will be better is, it's a huge ask. The odds against The Evil Within 2 would begin to increase as more information regarding the game would begin to come out, with that information being the confirmation that The Evil Within 2 was incorporating open world elements into the game, something that sounded like a step in the wrong direction in terms of ways to improve on its predecessor. The Evil Within 2 was both announced and released in 2017, and by that point, the open world genre was beginning to become so stagnant. Hell, we're in 
2022 and it's still a stagnant genre but we had gotten so many games whose open worlds failed to keep us engaged with their huge empty maps filled with useless collectibles and boring side quests with only the legend of zelda breath of the wild finally doing something fresh and new with the genre the same year the evil within 2 released so the sequel to a game that was originally linear in structure incorporating open world elements really didn't inspire much confidence from players going in. All in all, hype for the game wasn't anywhere near as enthusiastic as it was for its predecessor, due to there being a lot going against it. But this is partly what makes this game such an amazing achievement. It defied all the odds and actually managed to be an amazing game, with those worrisome open world elements actually being one of the stronger aspects of the game. Some way, somehow, the Evil Within 2's biggest strength actually comes from its open world, and that strength is the freedom it gives you when it comes to how you acquire new weapons and abilities. You can actually go through the entire game without getting the shotgun or the sniper rifle, because the only weapon you're scripted to get is the pistol. The others have to be found by exploring the many open worlds of Union, the town the game takes place in. Although the town might seem a lot less interesting than the assortment of environments from the first game, although I I feel like I'm remembering all those environments for all the wrong reasons. The Town of Union actually has a lot more going on than one would think at first glance. Union, huh? Looks like any town USA. It was designed that way to keep the test subjects calm and relaxed. Calm and relaxed. The exact opposite of Beacon. Union was built as a stereotypical, sterilized American town so that its residents will stay happy, calm, and easy to manipulate. But now that everything has gone horribly wrong, monsters roam the streets, and many of these once lively places are now abandoned, with text and audio logs giving much richer context and world building about the town than anything we ever got from the first game. Many of these logs can either present the stories and fates of the residents of Union, or can help guide the player to locations that contain valuable items or upgrades. Actually, engaging with these collectibles isn't mandatory, but they definitely help enrich the world and make progressing through the game much more exciting as you have a lot more options when it comes to weaponry. You really get what you put into it when it comes to exploring both of the game's open areas, and thankfully fully exploring the areas isn't that big of a task because the two large areas we get are actually quite small, but they make up for their small size with how dense they are in terms of side activities. Unless I can figure a way out. How is that possible? You really want me to waste your time talking a bunch of technical gibberish? Yeah, there, there's actual side activities within the game, along with collectibles, new weapons, and upgrades. But say you didn't really want to do all that much exploration. You could actually just skip straight to the main storyline and give yourself the more linear horror experience we got from the first game. And although the game might be a little bit more challenging, being as you'll be missing some weapons, the game won't stop you. But if you do choose to engage in the side activities, you'll find essential weapons like the Warden Crossbow. Or if you really want to go the extra mile, you can get yourself a makeshift flamethrower, or discover world events, or use the extra brain fluid you'll be collecting to potentially purchase the ability to slow down time? Yo, that sounds awesome! Yeah, don't worry, this isn't something that'll break the game's balance. Most people will never get this ability on their first playthrough unless they're really trying for it. But it is really cool that it's there and definitely encourages a second playthrough to try it out. The world truly is your oyster in this game, catering to both the people who want to take their time with the game along with those who only just want to experience the main story, with both of them being a valid option. The latter option is shockingly valid, honestly, because the story and characters in the Evil Within 2 are unexpectedly good. This is probably the most unexpected aspect of this game, the fact that the story and characters are actually good. More than good, in fact. They're pretty great. The last game's story was pretty bare bones, with shallow characters who said and did stupid things. What is it? I dropped my glasses back there. Oh, fuck off, Joseph. Combine that with the voice acting being 
pretty subpar, and you just get a wholly unsatisfying story whose lingering plot threads I couldn't care less about. Yet, some fucking how, The Evil Within 2 made me care. I think one of the things that bothered me the most about the Evil Within story was that all of the most interesting stuff regarding Sebastian, Kidman, and many other characters were either running in the background or were just really cryptic. In the Evil Within 2, many of the background goings-ons of the first game, like Kidman's shaky allegiance to the shadowy organization Mobius and Sebastian's personal life, have been brought to the forefront of this game, and this game's story is all the better for it. The original Evil Within's handling of those story beats was presented either through text logs or through paid DLC, which made a lot of it feel unsatisfying or underdeveloped. But the Evil Within 2's way of handling these story beats is by making the game all about Sebastian's personal life and Kidman's affiliation with Mobius. The Evil Within 2's narrative has Sebastian returning to the mind-boggling world of STEM for much more personal reasons this time. As opposed to being just trapped in STEM like in the first game, Sebastian returns willingly so he can save his once thought dead daughter from the Mobius-run STEM system, where she is being used as its core, while Kidman monitors and guides you from the outside. The story puts much more emphasis on the character and their motivations, as opposed to the last game, which was more interested in getting Sebastian from place to place. Sebastian actually forms relationships with the people he meets throughout the game, whether it be genuine friendships, reluctant ones, or a total dislike for somebody, which is a far cry from the basic relationships of the first game. The relationship that actually stands out the most in this game is Sebastian and Kidman's. Now that Kidman's affiliation with Mobius is out in the open, their partnership from the last game, which amounted to Sebastian really just taking her under his wing, and being of a mentor figure to her, and that being it, has now been changed completely, as their entire friendship and partnership was a complete lie. You wouldn't have told me about Lily if your damn machine didn't go on the fritz. I would have spent the rest of my life mourning her and you wouldn't have cared. I cared, but I couldn't say anything. They would have killed me. I'm not sure I believe you. Why would I lie about that? To manipulate me. To get me to perform like a good little soldier. You've lied to me before. Our whole friendship was built on a lie. Okay, I get it. And I don't blame you for feeling that way. You'll never know how I feel until you've lost your family. I never had a family to lose. Just two people who brought me into this world and treated me like a burden instead of a daughter. Better to have loved and lost? Is that what you're saying? The game takes total advantage of that fact by having one of the main collectibles of the game be projector slides containing many of Sebastian's critical memories, which lead to conversations between Sebastian and Kidman over radio where they reflect on their lives, relationships, choices, and the current state of things. The first time I saw Myra, she was wearing that uniform. I think I fell in love with her right then and there. I didn't want to admit it to myself. But after she was injured on duty, I knew I couldn't risk not telling her how I felt. She was such a great wife and mother that I sometimes forget she was a great detective, too. She was right. She knew there was something fishy about Lily's death. I, I mean, kidnapping. I should have believed her from the start. There's no way you could have predicted the truth, Sebastian. You know this. It's shockingly introspective and provides a lot of depth for these once flat characters. This relationship relates to actually one of the main themes of the game, that theme being redemption. Many of the characters throughout the game are seeking redemption for things they have done in their past, with that being the main part of Sebastian's motivation, as his daughter Lily can be narratively viewed as Sebastian's chance at redemption, along with a way of taking the life that was once taken away from him. Sebastian's journey throughout the game leads to him becoming a much more compelling protagonist than what we got from him in the first game, with the biggest reason for this being his voice acting. Anson Mount does not return to voice Sebastian. Actually, every single voice actor from the first game has been replaced, and with absolutely no offense to any of those actors, this was for the better. Sebastian is now voiced by Marcus Bobasic, and he brings so much life to Sebastian that Anson Mount unfortunately wasn't able to. Sebastian just has so much personality in this game, almost akin to Leon in Resident Evil 4 in some ways. Not bad. But the game also has moments where Sebastian shows genuine emotion and Marcus is more than up to the task, something you'll notice from one of the game's first cutscenes. You knew what was going to happen in that hospital, didn't you? What happened at Beacon is in the past. You need to forget it. You sound just like that psychologist that forced shoved down my throat. But he didn't have answers. You do. You're going to tell me. 
about Mobius. I'm here because of this. Where did you get this? Lily's still alive. <gasps> Lily is dead! I read the police report! I was at her funeral- Sebastian's redemption is such a satisfying story to experience as his drive to fix his past mistakes and take his life back makes you want to root for him, especially when nearly all of the antagonists are using his guilt and mistakes against him every step of the way. That's another aspect of this game that surpasses the first game. The antagonists are far more memorable than anything Ruvik could have done in the previous game. I know that's not saying much, being as he would either show up to give you the cheese touch- <laughs> or just not do anything at all, but not only are their backstories much more interesting, but their personalities are much more interesting as well. The first of the antagonists is Stefano Valentini, a crazed artist who murders his victim for the sake of his art, who seeks Lily so that he can use the power of the core to gain power and continue making his art uninterrupted. Something that may seem like a cliche we've all seen before, but it ends up leading to some of the coolest visuals in the whole game. The next antagonist is Father Theodore, a former motivational speaker and pseudo-religious cult leader who knows just what to say to get into your head. Each of the game's antagonists actually lead to significant changes in STEM, meaning that whoever is in control can bend and change the environment of Union to their will, allowing the open environments to not feel stale as they'll have new aesthetics and enemies during your return trips. It also adds a lot of added depth to the lore of the series as it retroactively makes the constantly shifting environments of the first game make a lot more sense in less frustrating as the core of that version of STEM was Ruvik, a mentally damaged and unstable psychopath. Meanwhile, the town of Union, which was created as the base for this version of STEM, while not constantly switching from random place to random place, is still being bended and shifted by much more mentally unstable psychopaths. We also get to see what a extensively monitored version of STEM looks like, as the game introduces the Marrow as your way of traveling between areas of the now unstable Union. The Marrow is a much more sterile environment than what you'll see in Union, and is where Mobius agents and scientists monitor the citizens of Union to ensure that they're under their control in acting as intended. It's sort of like a back rooms of sorts for the town of Union, and adds a lot to help make Mobius feel a lot more sinister than how they were represented at the beginning of the game, which is more cartoon villain. But the environments, Mobius agents, and documents found within Union make Mobius to be much more sinister and calculating, as you end up finding out they have been messing with Sebastian's life for years. Kidman was right. They are everywhere. They were right under my nose the entire time. Having a major part in his downward spiral. All of this really gives Sebastian's journey not only much more agency, but also makes it feel much more satisfying to play through as he overcomes his guilt, trauma, and flaws. You just really want to root for the guy, which is such a far cry from the Sebastian from the last game. In fact, I like Sebastian's arc throughout this game so much that upon his conclusion, I don't want him to return should a sequel ever be made. Sebastian earns the happy ending he gets, and any possibility of him returning would just undermine it, and he honestly doesn't deserve Deserve that. I was honestly shocked just how much I love the story of this game, although if I'm being honest, I think the big reason for it is because they actually made a conscious effort to make the story a lot easier to understand. What a fucking concept. But it's a really well told story with a compelling protagonist. But do you want to hear something else that's shocking? The game is a lot of fun to play too, especially when compared to his predecessor. Wow, who would have thought putting less bullshit into your game would actually make it more fun to play? Never saw that shit coming. The Evil Within 2 takes the combat from the first game and just makes it better. More weapons, no enemies with guns, thank god. Next to no instant deaths, oh thank the lord. Deaths that actually feel like my fault, you know, like a game should be, oh my god, I really fucking hate the first game, don't I? And much more freedom in how you approach the combat. The open areas not only allow for some great exploration, but they also give you a lot more choices when it comes to combat. Stealth is now an actual option, not just something you can do when the game decides you can do it and then forgets about it for 90% 
percent of the game. You can now use stealth in most combat encounters as a way to conserve ammo, with Sebastian now having an actual skill tree dedicated to it. The skill tree as a whole has been completely revamped. You no longer use green gel to upgrade guns, you use it for more practical abilities like reduce weapon sway, increase stealth kill distance, health regeneration, improving health syringes, or better sprint, an ability that is no longer a necessity because Sebastian is no longer a geriatric asthmatic mongoloid who can't sprint for more than 3 seconds due to his crippling alcohol addiction. Sebastian's set of abilities has been improved from the first game. He can now pull out his gun while holding single use axes as opposed to being forced to use it to get rid of it in the first game. You can collect bottles to use his distractions during stealth, while also being able to gain the ability to get out of enemy grabs using the bottles. And you can now do that again. Did you just aim your weapon while crouching? No fucking way! He can finally do it! He can do anything while crouched! Use his gun! Throw bottles while crouched! Use health syringes! Throw grenades! They took out grenades. Are you fucking serious? Sebastian can also roll over the hoods of cars while sprinting away from enemies. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Why did they take out grenades? The weapon upgrade system has also been revamped, so now you upgrade weapons with spare weapon parts found throughout the game's open environments, which can help increase the damage, the fire rate, reload speed, critical hit chances, along with the charge at time range for the returning crossbow. The game also adds another upgrade currency with the high grade weapon parts, a much rarer and more valuable resource that allows you to continue upgrading your weapon. I don't think there's actually enough high grade weapon parts for all of your weapons, so you should choose which weapons to prioritize on your initial playthrough. It also rewards replayability so that you can upgrade all of the weapons on for playthroughs. That isn't the end of the collectible resources though. The game also adds crafting materials so that you can use them to create health syringes, crossbow bolts, and ammo. It's actually an expansion of the spare parts system from the first game that was really only used for the crossbow bolts, which ended up fucking with the balance of the first game as by the midpoint of the game, you had way too many spare parts than you knew what to do with, so you constantly had crossbow bolts to use, which took away a lot of the tension that the low ammo count of the first game was supposed to have. All of these collectible resources tie back into the open environment and exploration. You won't be able to use many of these craftable resources if you don't take the time to explore the open environments. These resources will especially help when you're in the more linear portions of the game that are more reminiscent of the original, with the only difference being no stupid traps. The linear chapters of this game are just so much more fun to play than the original because things are actually working as intended. No crappy hit detection, no whack ass traps. If anything, this game makes fun of those dumbass traps. And best of all, no bosses that will instantly kill you! Thank the gods! The game is considerably better balanced than the first game. Enemies that will do shitloads of damage or aren't killed by stealth attacks have the fuck around and find out kind of look, whether it be whatever the fuck that is, or some old hag holding a kitchen knife under a streetlight. The game definitely does a better job at telegraphing dangerous attacks compared to the first game, whose bosses could instantly kill you on a fucking dime. The bosses in this game, however, are much more fun to fight because they don't instantly kill you, which makes the return in the open environments later in the game a lot less groan-inducing and actually pretty stressful. No monster. Sure. Why not? I'm not surprised by anything I see in here anymore. Won't have it again. I'll burn the end before they can change. When the game throws curveballs like this at you, it just doesn't really feel all that cheap. It actually gives you a rush of adrenaline as your plans are temporarily fucked with. The gameplay as a whole is just a marked improvement over the first, as it not only expands your options in terms of survivability, but also streamlines and improved mechanics from the last game, whether that be the improved skill and weapon trees, or just the flat out removal of the match mechanic from the first game, which has been replaced with just a head stomp you can use on downed enemies. Everything just feels and plays a lot better without compromising the challenge survival horror games present. Actually, the game does a much better job at scaring the player than anything the first game could have attempted. There's just a lot more creativity on display in this game. And that makes me so happy, because it proved to me that this studio can make some inspired enemy and environment design, and also make just a really fun and challenging game.
While the last game felt cliche and had bog standard enemy and horror design, Eve Within 2 has some good scares and great enemy and environment design. Right out the gate, the game has you enter STEM by way of this weird between worlds area that is dark, damp, and wet, with your only option being to move forward. It's a pretty great way to begin as it gives off an air of mystery as you really don't know what to expect from this game. From Sebastian's point of view, he's re-entering what he sees as the nightmare he barely survived only a few years ago, but from the player's point of view, we're not really sure what to expect because of just how different the opening to this game is compared to the first game. This time we're entering STEM voluntarily as opposed to being forced in like in the last game, so we're not really sure what will happen once we find something in this dark place. And what we do find is the game's safe area, which turns out to be Sebastian's office back at the Crimson City Police Department, a marked improvement over the last game's mental hospital safe room. There's just much more personality in this room. You have walls of notes connected with red string, with information that pertains to what Sebastian is doing, whether it's information on the Mobius agent stuck inside STEM, the town of Union, or the background of the game's antagonist. The safe room does a lot to develop Sebastian, as it's based around his memories, with the projector slides only being viewable from his room through the use of the projector. Sebastian's more likable personality shines here, as you can see that he, like the player, actually treats this place as a safe area, unlike the first game where Sebastian was admittedly appropriately on edge the whole time. In this game though, Sebastian is able to enjoy a nice cup of coffee, which brings you back up to full health. Millennials can relate or something, I don't know, I'm not a millennial. Sebastian's able to participate in a shooting range, which can actually net you some pretty valuable rewards, along with seeing his great victory poses and reactions. You're the best around, detective. And nothing's ever gonna keep me down. The shooting range is actually appropriately based on the previous game, showing that in many ways Sebastian is still reeling from the events of Beacon Hospital. That goes for upgrading his abilities as well, where he is quite literally brought back to the upgrade chair found in the first game, where Nurse Tatiana returns and remains just as cryptic as ever. Although this time it feels like there's a lot more charm to her, as she directly interacts with you as opposed to her feeling like she was always talking at you instead of to you in the first game. Sebastian also remembers to thank the cat who gives green gel after you view your memory slides. Thanks, kitty. Sebastian's such a great guy. I don't even know why there's a cat here, but after playing the game, this safe room would just feel weird without it. Once you leave this room, you'll find that many of the environments are a huge step up from the last game, with Stefano's areas being a highlight, which have great uses of the colors red and blue, with the color red representing what Stefano has dubbed his Crimson Period, a reference to Picasso's Blue Period, and the blue being used for these amazing looking sequences where Stefano's victims are frozen in time, forced to live these Instagram boomerangs for the rest of time. Stefano's areas also give way to the best scares as he has two major boss enemies at his disposal. The first being the Guardian, which is a manifestation of one of his art pieces. And then there's the Obscura, the highlight of the game's enemy design. This boss enemy not only looks incredibly fucked up, but it sounds or just something else, man. It's like a conscious being caught between pain and pleasure, and it just makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> This is better than anything the first game had, and this is only from the first few hours of the game. The areas and enemies that follow are no slouch either, as we get these enemies that can catch on fire, adding a bit of extra challenge to the stealth, along with these rad looking flamethrower enemies who are devout followers of Father Theodore. His areas are pretty cool as well, as we get medieval dungeons with a bunch of religious imagery, an infinite staircase like in Mario 64, and a wonderfully decorated cathedral where Theodore resides. And in what would sound like an awful idea, Theodore's mind games against Sebastian actually bring back bosses from the first game in a boss rush style fight, yet this game executes it so well, I can't even be mad, because not only are these bosses actually fun to fight this time, but thematically they work incredibly well, as Sebastian confronting them represents him overcoming his own self-doubts and trauma, but also shows just how much he's willing to do to save his daughter. It's actually some brilliant writing, because we spend the whole of the last game growing to hate and dread these enemies. Some of them for the wrong reasons, but hate and dread all the same. So to be able to make short work of these enemies is a great way to show how much Sebastian has grown. Plus, how can you be mad when it leads to this happening? Enough of this shit!
This will stop me. I'm not gonna lie, I actually kind of shit bricks when Lisa emerged from the Keeper's head, but like in a good way. And did I mention the music in this scene? Like it should not go this hard, but it does, and it is all the better for it. All of this leads to some of the most beautiful and serene environment design I've seen in a game as the final antagonist takes control of the stem system and what we get is just this white barren wasteland with nothing but a house and I'm assuming the mystery box on the horizon, bringing us a wonderful and emotionally resonant ending that I won't dare spoil. The Evil Within 2 carves out its own identity, which is such a breath of fresh air, especially when compared to the last game, which tried way too hard to recapture that Resident Evil 4 magic. The Evil Within 2 just has a lot of personality, one that even separates itself from the game series it was inspired by, making it a game that I'll remember fondly for quite a long time. Now we get to the most heartbreaking things surrounding this game. It's unfortunately not all sunshine or rainbows for this game, even though it's good. Great. I love this game. It was my third playthrough, and I expect myself to do more in the future. But the legacy of the first game rears its ugly head here, and it prevents it from becoming the success it deserved to be. Like I mentioned before, the first game was a financial success, and although it wasn't a critical darling, and I can't confirm with 100% certainty those high sales were because of Shinji Mikami reputation, that success got a sequel greenlit, but the watchful eye of their publisher Bethesda caused the game's development cycle to be rushed. That rushed development cycle led to the aforementioned year and a half development time. That means The Evil Within 2 still has some bugs. Shockingly, nothing game-breaking, especially when you hear any involvement from Bethesda, but there's still some that are noticeable, like some AI pathing issues, or this weird one where the ghosts that can spawn in and stalk you throughout the open environments just wouldn't go away until I ran an absurd distance away. The game unfortunately didn't get the chance to fix some of these bugs, because any further development on the game ended not too long after the release, because the game didn't really sell all that well compared to its predecessor, with sales in its first week being estimated to be a quarter of what the first game had in its first week. We've actually never been given an official sales number for this game. The critical reception of this game wasn't going to light the world on fire either. With them being nowhere near bad, the game hovered pretty comfortably around an 8 out of 10, but for some people burned by the first game, 8 out of 10s don't really sell people on a sequel to a game that they didn't really enjoy or were disappointed by. And it's unfortunate because the game all these years later is still one of the better horror titles I've played in recent years. So I implore people to give this game a try. If you're a masochist like me, play through the first game to get the most out of it, and if you're a normal person, you can quickly brush up on the story and lore. You don't need to worry, it's not this master's thesis worth of information like Kingdom Hearts or something where you're just blasted of ramblings about the darkness. Say fellas, did somebody mention the door to darkness? <laughs> It's a pretty accessible sequel for newcomers, so I definitely recommend what I now consider to be a horror cult classic. Who knows, it might just be your next favorite. And the video's finally done. So that was The Evil Within 2, one of the better horror games to come out in recent years. Although, I do struggle to call it the best horror game of its release year because, well, I forgive you for forgetting that another prolific horror series did return, uh, I mean, I forgive you for forgetting, because 2017 was just this absolute jam-packed year for gaming. How naive we all were, thinking it only gets better from there. But yeah, in January 2017, a certain entry in a prolific survival horror series released, bringing the series back to its horror roots after Shinji Mikami shifted it more towards an action focus. That's right, I'm talking about Resident Evil 7, the amazing return to form for the series that sold less than its predecessor despite better critical reception. Now that I think about it, the Evil Within 2 and Resident Evil 7 actually have a lot more in common than I thought.
unfortunate as it is that The Evil Within 2 and Resident Evil 7 didn't get to share the same commercial success, it's pretty easy to see why Resident Evil 7 would be the more successful title. So join us next time as we take a look at Capcom's modern horror classic with Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. <laughs>